Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this episode of the Midweek Supplemental, we're going to talk about uh, some knife life news. We got a couple of new knives, one from Tops, one from Civivi, one from Boker take a look at. And then in the state of the collection, uh, what's one thing, uh, two things new, uh, both leather. And then we're going to talk about my top 10 swords and machetes. Uh, But first, as we always do here at the Knife Junkie Podcast, to break the ice, we will bear our pockets. This is my pocket check. And today I am at home and I am in jeans. So I feel no issues whatsoever carrying my cold steel XL Recon 1 in XHP steel and that beautiful Bowie blade. Beautiful Bowie blade. If you're watching this, uh, you can see that the camera is way up high today. Uh, Much wider screen today because we're going to be talking about swords. So I I need a little bit more room. But that also gives me a perfect opportunity to show off this five and a half inch uh, CTS XHP beautifully styled Bowie blade. Now look at how broad this blade is. It is um, over an inch. It's like an inch and three quarters inches wide from the top to the bottom. Fully flat ground so that it is screamingly thin and sharp behind that long five and a half inch edge. I uh, really do like this uh, Recon one handle. Um, What it's got going for it, especially over the uh, the XL Voyagers, in my opinion, is the thinness. The XL Voyagers have a little bit more in the way of options with all the grooves and finger accommodations, especially more towards the tail end of uh, the Voyager handle. But the Recon 1 offers a neutrality that is nice, especially back here. And also just that thinness. For me, it's way more realistic to carry uh, than a um, than a Voyager. Voyager just is just a little bit too bulky. And believe me, I'm not a skinny jeans wearer by any stretch of the imagination. So I would imagine for someone who's actually fashionable, uh, it it would be even more difficult. Okay, so uh, I also have something else on today uh, that I'm carrying, something more practical. Uh, but I'm 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 in a Bowie mood today, so uh, so it is that indeed. But it's this is the uh, Emerson Appalachian. This is uh, probably right out of the box my sharpest Emerson knife. Uh, it it has got a very if you can see how wide the 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 final chisel edge is on this knife. It's very wide. Whoever sharpened this uh, sharpened it quite shallowly. Uh, if that's a word. And uh, so it is very, very, very thin. Now, you'll find that chisel bladed, uh, chisel edged knives tend to be quite thin behind the edge. Uh, they will ha- they will have different cutting characteristics. They will track differently through material. And I think that can be a turnoff to some people. Uh, but you can get these uh, chisel edge knives so incredibly sharp that if you learn how to sort of steer the edge through a material in a slightly different way, uh, you'll be shocked at how sharp these things get. Uh, Now, uh, this knife is a little bit different than say, a chisel ground um, CQC7, which the entire side of the blade is flat on one side and then you have the grind. Well, the grind is gonna be a little bit steeper, so it uh, it will be very, very stout behind the edge um, and, and sharp and capable, but it won't be as, uh, razor thin behind the edge as it will be on one of these V ground Emersons where the full blade is re- is V ground and only the edge is a chisel. So yeah, that's my practical choice today. The uh, Emerson Appalachian uh, sitting right next to the Recon 1 uh, XL in XHP steel. Now th- these XL uh, Recons have become quite uh, coveted uh, these days. They're hard to find. And I think that's part of what GSM will take care of. (laughs) 
that is what you want a large distribution company for uh, so that you can produce more knives, get more knives out to market. And hopefully they do that with the Recon 1. People will, uh, the XL Recon 1, people will come running. Okay, so uh, th uh, two new gentlemen junkies to announce. These are uh, new patron, uh, Patreon patrons at the $10 level. Uh, they are Nick Martino and Jason Edwards. Uh, two familiar names around here. Uh, Nick Martino, we see him a lot on Thursday Night Knives. So uh, great to have him on. Thank you. And Jason Edwards, thank you as well, sir. It is greatly appreciated. Uh, so being a gentleman junkie actually affords you uh, a, a couple of things. You get Knife Junkie stickers. You get a mention on the podcast, like I just said, Nick Martino and Jason Edwards. Uh, you get early access to the Sunday interview and the midweek supplemental podcasts uh, with no ads during the show. And at the top tier of support, you're automatically entered into a knife giveaway. Now, this month, that knife giveaway is the We Banter. The We Banter is uh, the knife made by, uh, well, designed by Blade HQ's um, um, former, uh, uh, oh my gosh, my his name is just... Phew, uh, ben, Ben from Blade HQ. Uh, we all know Ben loved that Blade HQ blue, and he liked a knife that uh, whose blade length was just as long as his forefinger so that the tip uh, of his finger would reach the tip of the blade for that kind of work, that sort of draw cut work. I imagine he opened a lot of boxes at Blade HQ, and this is the knife he designed. It's a three-inch uh, we produced a uh, thumb stud knife on bearings, as you can see, and uh, with that Ben Blue handle. Now, it comes in a number of different handles now, uh, but I'm going to stick. Uh, we stuck with the Ben Blue. That's kind of the, the true spirit of the thing, if you ask me. So uh, that's what uh, gentlemen junkies are in line to win. Um, your support helps fund the infrastructure needs of the show, hosting, servers, apps, and equipment, and knives to review and donate and do giveaways with. So check us out on Patreon and see what helping us can get you. The quickest way to get there is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So you know I love Topps Knives and they have so many models. It's unreal. And that's one of the things I love about them. They, they, uh, they started out in the tactical military uh, realm. They expanded into the bushcraft and camping realm. Uh, and, and then they expanded into the kitchen realm. And right now they, they just came out with a new fillet knife and that's, it's their first fillet knife. And to me, it's cool to see they are, they are bridging, straddling the outdoor realm and the kitchen realm here, obviously with a fillet knife. Um, I look at it and of course I see a sort of Persian-esque fighter <laughs> because everything tops does kind of has a little aggressive uh, edge to it, if you will. Of course, a fillet knife is a, what a fillet knife is. It's that upsweeping blade. But just looking at it in hand with the jimping and the and the whole setup here, uh, and knowing that it's on the lioness handle, uh, a handle that's been used for the lioness and for the Scandi, um, it's it's. I know that grip. It's a great grip, and it's a grip that's been used, you know, in their tactical knives in the past. So to me, it just looks like one of their small tactical knives with a big blade on it. But of course, it's way thinner than any other tops, and uh, but apparently still a little bit thicker than your average, uh, you know, Rapala or something like that. So it is a stout outdoor knife, uh, stout enough to do other chores. Uh, but this will take care of your boning and filleting needs. And I believe it's 154 cm, which is uh, one of the their go-to stainless steels. And uh, uh, you know, it's it's no it's no uh, it's no uh, what's the what's the word? What am I trying to say? It's not a mystery why they go to 154 cm. It sharpens up quickly. It it takes an incredible edge. And it's a great field steel, I think. Uh, it's, it's easy, it's what Emerson has always used. It's easy to sharpen in the field. Uh, that's why I mentioned Emerson. That's always been one of their things. Uh, so for a stainless steel field knife, I think it's a, it's a great thing. Plus I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, if, if you're a steel nerd, but I think, I think it's tougher than a lot of stainless steels and uh, toughness 
could add to flexibility. I mean, that's basically what toughness is. Uh, we, we talk about toughness meaning flexibility on impact, but here we're talking about maybe flexibility in a thin blade. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if 154 CM is also a, uh, a, a reason for that. So that is the new tops. What are they calling it? Oh, they're calling it fillet knife. So very aptly named as, uh, as Ben Schwartz mentioned. Okay. So next is, uh, a new knife from Civivi. Civivi is so... Mm, they're so established. It's like, I, I, I wish Tangram had, had taken off the way Civivi has taken off. Tangram was the downstream brand for Kaiser. And I had a couple of their, have slash had a couple of their knives and they were exceptional. Civivi has just, man, they, they have just taken off. So this is the new, this is the brazen taken off. I mean, they've taken off a long time ago, but they keep coming out with designs and they all look really good. And some of them are, are, our collaborations and some like this are in-house and look at that Americanized Tanto on that purple handle. I mean, is that not a, it's a beautiful little EDC. Now it's a 3.4 inch blade. It's called the Brazen. Uh, the the uh, Tanto, which is what we're looking at here is in uh, D2. And then you can get a drop point. Uh, the drop point version is 14C 28N. I haven't seen the drop point version yet, but Looking at this, like I said, I love that Americanized Tanto blade with the beautiful swedge on top. And uh, that purple handle is fetching. I, I've, I had one purple knife. It was a Wii. It was anodized titanium, 609, I believe. A uh, big, goofy-looking Warncliffe. It was a great knife, but I ended up selling it to get to to get something else. Uh, but the purple has never left me. I love it. I you know Like on my new... Um, uh, mini RSK1 from Hogue. It's got that purple G-Mascus. Something about the color. It's holy. It's royal. It's, uh, you know, there's there's a lot to it. And on this Civivi Brazen, I think it looks really cool. So if I were to get the Civivi Brazen, I would get it in, uh, I would get this Tanto here. Now, I, I believe it's a flipper and thumb stud, but optimized for thumb stud, if I read correctly. Uh, but who knows? <laughs> Often I don't. Uh, just ask Mrs. Knife Junkie. Uh, okay, so let's go on to the last knife here on Knife Life News. And we talked about this a little bit on Thursday Night Knives. I think it bears re-mentioning because it is uh, an example, actually probably the leading example of how a single uh, knife design can just really just run the gamut of iterations here. Of course, we're talking about the uh, Lucas Burnley designed Quaken by Boker. Uh, it started as a custom knife, as most Burnley uh, designs do. Started as a custom knife and then took the knife world by storm. Uh, it's been around for at least a decade. Uh, first came out as a thumb stud version, and then people started uh, started tweaking it, and they cut back on the bolster, and then you could make it a front flipper, and then Boker put a flipper on it, and then they made a small version, and then they made an automatic version, and then a fixed blade version, and then a kitchen version, and here they've come out with an out the front version. Look at that. So you can see that classic shaped Boker Burnley uh, uh, Quaken handle there. Um, it's got all the contours, all the, you know, the, the, the exact profile. And then you see the exact profile of the Quaken blade coming out of it. However, they look like they're on they're four two different knives. Now, when you're making out the front knife, you need a little bit extra on the tail uh, end to accommodate all the guts, you know, the springs and stuff. And uh, so you're not going to get an, a, an outstanding blade to handle ratio uh, oftentimes. Um, <clears throat> and here, this is no exception. To me, the handle looks awkwardly long. Uh, but it, it's a great, I think it's a, it's a, uh, I think it's a good looking solution to the out the front problem for the Quaken. Perhaps a problem that didn't exist, but why not try, you know, why not make an out the front? Uh, they're using a, an American company called Cobra Tech uh, that specializes in out the front knives. Uh, I went to the Cobra Tech uh, Instagram page and uh, yes, the, indeed, you, you, you will see a lot of very aggressive looking out the front knives there. This one looks like they really took advantage of Cobra Tech's uh, 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 knowledge of the internals because this looks nothing like any of the Cobra Tech knives I saw. This is obviously understated and simple, has that, uh, that Quaken look. 
mm, I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? It'll be interesting to see. Uh, I bet uh, it'll look better in video than in that picture. For some reason, it just looks uh, really awkwardly handle heavy. Uh, but but we shall see. I think it's a great uh, great idea. I like I like how this design has had such superior legs. Uh, you know, they've made it into so many different versions. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for the Cobra Tech made uh, Boker Burnley Quaken out the front, coming your way. Uh, still to come on the Knife Junkie podcast, we will have a state of collection. We'll take a quick look at a couple of new things for me, and we'll get to my top 10 swords and machetes. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life news, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. So this week's state of the collection, um, I have no new knives, uh, but I have two new things that are leather and, uh, and have to do with knives. And you can probably guess what they both are, but I'll start with this. Uh, I received this uh, that just a few days back and it is the amazingly beautiful Spartan Harzy dagger sheath made by Chattanooga Leatherworks. And, uh, as you know, recently I bought the I bought the beautiful Spartan Harzy dagger uh, from someone on Blade Forums, and it came in a, a regular sort of tactical kind of uh, nylon sheath that I could just barely stand. It was just there to keep this wicked blade, uh, you know, from jumping out. Uh, I finally ordered this. And man, it is a superior piece of sheath work. It is absolutely gorgeous. You can see they put the uh, Spartan Blades logo. That's the hoplite helmet and the uh, crossed arrows with the dagger uh, emblazoned on the front here. This, this leather is just beautiful to look at and to touch. It's this brown tanned leather. And this design is crazy. As you can see here, they have six areas that accommodate any kind of like uh, any any kind of mounting hardware. You could put a blade tech. Uh, what the hell are those things called? You know, you could put all the different kinds of uh, uh, sheath attachments onto this knife because this back strap here that has the uh, belt loop on it unscrews. You can take this whole panel off and just have the leather sheath part and attach any kind of mounting you want on it. But it's all leather. Like I've never seen this on an all leather knife. It's, it behaves and can be mounted just like Kydex. And then as you can see, it's got this, this awesome uh, strap that comes across and, and you know keeps the blade in the sheath. Uh, it's one of these pull the dot uh, snaps. I don't like pull the dot. I know everyone thinks it's very precision, and I find that every I've had a problem with every single pull the dot snap I've ever had. Uh, and I've well, I've only had about like maybe four or five. My brother made me a frog for one of uh, for my um, one of my bowies, and he put two of those on there, and they are a pain in the butt. They they either don't unsnap or they unsnap at the like that, and I just don't. I don't know. Someone needs to convince me. It's like uh, Steven Crowder. Tell me, prove, prove I'm wrong. Okay, so Chattanooga Leatherworks. I think they do all of the leather for um, for uh, uh, Spartan blades. So if you have a Spartan blade and you want a leather sheath, man, I would I would highly highly recommend it. Um, just go to their website and um, they'll have it to you in a flash. I swear, it came so quickly. And my dagger sheath needs were finally, finally taken care of. <clears throat> okay, next up in the state of the collection is another piece of leather. This is a strop. I've been using my same homemade strop for years and years, and I, it just got so funky and just so, um, I don't know, I, I just dreaded using it. And, and I said, why don't I just spend the $18 and buy a new strop? And uh, basically, that's what I did. I, I did not do much research at all. And uh, I went on to Amazon and I bought a paddle strop. I knew I wanted a paddle strop. Uh, this has suede on one side and a smooth leather on the other. It's shipped with two compounds, uh, 9,000 grit and 6,000 grit. Uh, 6,000 is the green and then 9,000, I believe, is the white. 
And so I put the white, the finer on the, on the smoother leather side and the green on the suede side. And I stropped all day yesterday. Well, all night. I stropped a great number of knives here and um, man, wow, what a difference. What a difference. My homemade strop is fine. And, uh, and I just watched Inglorious Bastards the other night, and there's that scene where Stieglitz is, is sharpening his dagger on his belt. You know, he's just dropping it on his belt. Such a great scene. And, and I like that you can, you can strop on your jeans. I mean, you can strop on cardboard. You can do a lot of, but what a difference a real fine um, strop makes. I mean, this leather is sumptuous and this, and the, uh, and this uh, suede side took the, the green compound so nicely. So I, I do recommend now, um, it's great to make your own strop indeed. And, and I've talked about how to do that and talked about how much I use my own homemade strop. But having this in hand, uh, I really see, it's like double wide compared to mine. And I, I really see what having fine leather and suede and having the right compound and all that uh, can do. So, um, well, that's all I can say. Strop. I'm always talking about getting a strop or, or doing your stropping. This, now I'm saying get a good one. And uh, this paddle is handy, I got to say. So paddle strop. Uh, lastly, in the state of the collection, I, I ordered something uh, this week that... Uh, Man, it was one of those things. I was biting my nails for days, and then I and then I did it. And I, I'm not sure why it was such a difficult decision. It's not like I haven't made decisions like this many times. Uh, but uh, anyway, I did. And I want you to guess what it is. And if you guess what it is correctly, the first person to to leave it in the comments on YouTube, let, we'll we'll say that. Uh, wins a t-shirt, a don't take dull for an answer t-shirt. Uh, Jim designed these. They're super awesome. This is an XL and uh, you can walk around town and mysteriously tell everybody that you are a knife junkie fan. And what I mean by mysteriously is this one doesn't have our logo on it. So people will be like, don't take dull for an answer. What does that mean? It will be like the Gabibo episode of, uh, of, uh, of the Simpsons in like the third season, a hundred thousand years ago. Uh, Gabo, what is Gabo? It's the same thing. People will be walking around saying, what is this? Don't take doll for an answer. So anyway, guess what I just ordered. And, uh, and you'll win that if you guess it correctly. Now, since it could have been anything, I will give you a hint. It's not a folder. It is a knife. It's not a folder. So what is it? What did I get? What did I order? It's something that, hmm, it's a commitment. If you're going to order it, uh, it's a commitment. Now, I did mine a, a different way, and it's going to come to me quickly. Oh, I said too much now. All right. Someone's going to get it from that. All right. Well, so that does it for the state of the collection. Now we're going to get down to the real important topic of conversation here today, which is we're kind of coming to the end of, I've had a, uh, a some top, top 10 lists. I kind of Wanted to go through my collection, kind of catalog the different sub collections and categories and kind of um, uh, if I have more than 10 of them, bubble up the top 10. And then I've been doing some runners up today. I'm not doing any runners up, but just to really kind of catalog my collection that way. And uh, we're, we're coming to the culmination of it. There might be one more implements of mayhem, but I don't know if that would be uh, I don't know if we're going to do that here. Uh, but today we're doing my top 10 swords and machetes. And these are not all of the machetes and swords, though I don't have a huge sword collection, uh, but I have a number of very big knives. Uh, and, and so a number of them I call swords because in the cultures from which they come, uh, like, uh, well, chief among them, the Philippines, they only have one really long sword by European standards the Campilan, and I don't have that one. They might have a couple other. I know, I know they have the Panabas, which is a big blade on the end of a big handle. Uh, um, but in any case, we're going to go down the ones that I have. And, uh, and these are some prize knives and swords. And uh, they, they spend time around the house. I don't have them in cabinets uh, or anything like that. Or I have one that I keep hanging. But everything, every, every, play, every other sword, they're kind of stashed in good places. All right. Let's start with, uh, 
So the first one is a cold steel. Now this one is the Shisa Katana. I'm going to get this drop out of the way here. So the Shisa Katana is, uh, the characteristics of this sword are that it is a katana. It's got an extra sort of wide and stout blade that is shorter than your regular sized katana. Hmm. It's not fitting completely on the screen. It's got a long handle, just like a katana, and a shorter blade. Now, this, the purpose of this knife or of this sword uh, was for people guarding doorways or expecting to fight inside in hallways and this kind of thing. And uh, so you're not carrying around a super long sword that's going to get hung up on the ceiling or hung up on the walls as you're swinging it around. And uh, so this is kind of a, a guard's sword. Now, as you can see, it is really beautifully produced by Cold Steel. This is uh, probably from the early 2000s. I can't remember exactly when I got this. And I'm not sure if their swords are being made by the same, you know, uh, I know different factories make different swords. I'm pretty sure they take special care with the katana style swords. This is, uh, has the traditional um, sort of mounting where the blade ha is a partial tang and then it's, it's pegged in here. You can see a peg right there. And I'm sure it's, uh, I'm sure it's epoxied in there too, but uh, this thing is amazing. It's sharp. It's kind of heavy. And, uh, but you shouldn't say that about a sword, right? You say, it's kind of heavy. Hey, you should just say, this is what I will use to guard the doorway with. And it's a great one to have in the house too. It's great for guarding a suburban house. All right. Next is a sword that's near and dear to me because it's the uh, it's a Filipino sword from Pekiti Tersha Kali, and uh, use it's the primary weapon in Pekiti Tersha Kali in terms of uh, large weapons. Uh, it's called the Ganunting, and this is made by Traditional Filipino Weapons or TFW. We've had their American uh, uh, founder. Ron Kazakowski on the show. He's a, uh, a gentleman from Connecticut who has a Kali school and teaches people how to use sticks and knives and swords and fight Jeet Kune Do, Bruce Lee style. And uh, he also has this business, Traditional Filipino Weapons, where he has some, uh, some knife makers and sword makers down in the Philippines, kind of working in secret, making, uh, making all of these patterns traditional, beautiful patterns from the Philippines. You know, there are many, many islands, many different uh, little subcultures, and they all have their different blade styles and handle styles. Man, the handles are incredible. So uh, Ron Kazakowski has traditional Filipino weapons down there. These, uh, these guys forging out these blades. And uh, so this is the Ganunting. It's got that sort of uh, swept down sort of sickle shape. And uh, it is wicked, wicked for cutting and chopping and slashing. It's got a sharpened tip. Uh, if you if you buy one now, they've they've about uh, doubled the length of the sharpened uh, top edge, which I would love to have, but you know I already have this one. And uh, also, my handle is unique. It's a cam camagong, I, I think handle. Uh, actually, Dave corrected me. I can't remember exactly what this hardwood is, but usually you see it all dark, and this one has a nice uh, has a nice feature in it. Uh, brass ferrule and guard. This thing is wicked. All right, I'm going to put that over here right next to the samurai. I wonder if a samurai sword ever went up against the Ganun thing, like in World War II or something in the jungle. Okay. All right. Next is, uh, oh, yes. This was a gift. A gift from my lovely wife. Uh, she bought this at one of the 6th Avenue flea markets in New York City that probably don't exist anymore, but I've gotten a lot of my, my uh, Filipino weapons from there because a lot, of, uh, a lot of the people who sell knives there sell estate sale stuff, and there was a lot of bring back stuff from World War II. This is, I'm not sure about the origin of this wakizashi, 
but it's got a beautiful green um, skate skin scabbard. If you can see that, it's it's skate skin that's been uh, sanded and polished down and lacquered. And so it's got this incredible, like, it looks like bubbles in a bubble bath, if you look closely, but in this gorgeous green. Now, of course, this paracord is a as kind of a silly addition that I've done, but it's so that I can hang it on my wall. If you look closely here at the scabbard, you'll see right here. So this is where a lace would go through. And that is actually a couple in a loving embrace, if you will. I'm not sure if you can see that, but uh, yeah, that's a couple in a loving embrace. And you, you, you put your lace through there. This here is a, uh, a little utility knife that comes out that uh, is pretty much jammed in there. <laughs> and then here's the blade. You can see a, a hamon line there. Pretty sure that's real. I mean, I've I've examined this thing, and I I, I it seems quite legit. I just don't know where or when, but it's a it's a very beautiful blade. And I I guess if I had my druthers, I would pop this off. But I don't want to take the handle off, and and look at the tang stamp. Um, if anyone knows anything about uh, wakizashis or traditional Japanese weapons and can date this, I suspect it's 20th century or something like that, but I just don't know when, where. But it's a beautiful, beautiful wakizashi, and, and part of what really takes the cake about it is this uh, beautiful sheath or scabbard. Okay. Thank you, baby. Best wife in the world. All right, here we go. Next. Also from traditional Filipino weapons. This is my Espada Idaga set. I have a beautiful uh, pair of leather sheaths that my brother made for these, but I'll show you how it comes traditionally. It comes in this wooden scabbard that has uh, the scabbard for the dagger. This is a, a, it's not an actual dagger, but that's daga, I guess, is knife in, in Tagalog. And it has it mounted together like this. So I will show you both. Here is the, the knife part. Uh, by the way, these are uh, high carbon uh, steel, screaming, spring steel is very, very extremely sharp. And, uh, and, um, what do you call it? Convex ground, just whew, screaming sharp. But again, you have these beautiful hardwood handles. Look at that. That is just really beautiful work. And, and with that bird's beak there, your hand just nestles in there and it's going nowhere. This is great for um, practicing. You know, if you're, if you're a practitioner of, of uh, Filipino martial arts or blade arts, these are really great for carefully training with. Um, not all the time, of course, and you don't want to get brazen with it. Uh, but all right, now here is the sword version of it. Same handle, you know, a little bit bigger, obviously. But uh, it is the same sort of clip point shape. Now that top edge, that false edge is not sharpened. Um, which makes it, I guess, just a swedge. This is a great pair. They uh, Traditional Filipino ma weapons makes two different Espada y Daga pairs uh, with uh, two different uh, kind of uh, blade profiles. Uh, on the other one, the sword has a much heavier kind of machete-like uh, shape with a, with, a, with a heavier end and then a more recurved and shorter uh, knife. But, you know. They're all cool. What can I say? All right. So that's kind of a twofer there. The Espada Idaga. Next and last traditional Filipino weapon here. You've seen this. This is sort of a uh, sort of a mascot of the show from time to time. But this is this is the gladius, the Roman gladius, the Roman sidearm sword 
uh, as, as interpreted by traditional Filipino weapons. Now, they obviously, they have begun to make weapons beyond the Filipino uh, pane, I think they call it. That's the panoply, I guess. Um, and, uh, and this was one of the first Western uh, blades they made. It is very sharp on both edges. And um, someone, I think, said this was a mainz pattern. Mm. Or I could be wrong. There were, there were two main patterns of Gladius uh, in terms of the blade shape. One that kind of flared out a little bit uh, towards the tip. And then I, may, I think that was the mains pattern. And then I don't know what this is called. Uh, but this has the parallel edges instead of the sort of triangulated uh, edge. It's got a beautifully uh, sculpted wooden handle that if I were going to actually use this in combat, I would flatten the sides of this. This is a circular handle, and I'm sure that that's traditionally how they were made, but circular handles tend to turn in your hand on impact, so I would I would shave off a little bit on, on the side of that. But since I'm not using this for combat, this was a gift from my brother. Uh, ordinarily, I would, but it's a gift from my brother, so um, I'm going to leave it pristine. Um, but, you know, who can't help but think of what they would do if they were to use a sword in combat? And for this one here, you know what? I'm going to put all the beautiful hilts up here so you can see. Because that is, uh, the you know, swords are obviously beautiful for their blades and such. But look at some of these wooden hilts. They're just gorgeous. These sheaths out of the way. This is a, this is a bulky kind of top ten list. So uh, now we're, we're heading into the machetes and uh, the smaller, couple of uh, the smaller things. Now this is another gift from my brother. This is a Collins machete uh, from the World War I or pre like right around the turn of the, uh, what was it? Spanish, the Spanish uh, American, when is this from? This is from around World War I and before, okay. There you go. I just I just totally laid bare my my lack of knowledge of history. I, I I'm ashamed. Okay, so this is a beautiful, really heavy quarter inch slab of uh, you know machete. This this is uh, based on I believe some Filipino bolo designs, but it's an American uh, produced blade. I have a. Um, I have a collection selection video on this knife. Uh, and when I made that, I had a little bit more research at my, uh, fresh in my mind. And I talk about, about the, uh, the providence of this, but this thing is just wicked. And you could see how, you know, this is this, if this is part of your kit, you know, you're wearing some big, heavy canvas outfit, you know, cause back then they didn't have all the high tech garbage that we have now in terms of fabric. So they're, 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 they've got heavy water-soaked uniforms. They've got all sorts of heavy equipment, a big rifle, load-bearing equipment that isn't nearly as sophisticated as today. And then they have this two-pound slab of steel hanging on their on their belt. I mean, these are these are these are stout-hearted men who, uh, who who carried and used these things. I mean, this is a this is a slab. This is a big tool. Collins machete. Thank you, Victor. Uh, I haven't used it for anything, but I know you could split anything with this thing in one one chop. One. Just one. It's pretty amazing. But look at that angle of the handle to the blade. Love that. I mean, talk about chopping. Now, this, this I'm sure would be great for anything, but I think of this as heavier vegetation and wood. Um, I think of a lighter, thinner machete as, as uh, being ideal for the lighter uh, wetter stuff. Okay. That's the Collins machete. Now this next one is one of the first blades I ever bought. I bought it from PSS public safety supply in Mayfield, Ohio in the early to mid eighties. And, uh, I've talked about this thing a lot. This is in a sheath that my brother made. Incidentally, it's a beautiful sheath. I think this was the first thing he ever made out of leather. But the knife is the Ontario machete. This is a standard issue 
Ontario Knife Company, U.S. Army Machete. I bought this from Public Safety Supply after seeing Kona and the Barbarian. Uh, and I, I I stained the sheath to look like the the how Conan stained his body uh, before they go on the special mission at the end, and um, <laughs> this is this has been with me ever since. And I put an incredible edge on it. It's 10.95 steel. It's tough as you would not believe. Now there was a time uh, where I was home visiting my parents, and um, in Ohio and it was in their old house and there were woods in the back and a big oak tree fell and it was probably you know hmm, a foot and a half through and my dad and I went back there with axes and started chopping at it and it was like uh you know we're not we're not guys who are ordinarily going out and chopping trees and so after a while I was like man this is this is really just doesn't seem practical these dull axes so I went and got this machete and uh, chopped through that tree in, I don't know, maybe it took an hour or something, but it was the machete that did it. The axes were, um, now granted, they weren't the sharpest axes uh, in the world, but this machete spanned so much of the, uh, spanned so much of the tree that we could just get huge hunks, you know, coming out of it. And it's thin and springy, so it it, it virtually slipped through the atoms. <laughs> so uh, this machete is still with me and still, uh, you know, does work outside. Whenever I need anything machete-like, this is the one that I bring. The Ontario, uh, the Ontario company, what is it? U.S. Army um, issue, standard issue in 1095 steel. This thing is awesome. I highly recommend it. You can pick one up today. All right. What do we have next? Next is a, a barong. This is my prized Filipino pickup. Uh, this is something that uh, I got one of the Sixth Avenue flea markets in New York City in the early 2000s. And uh, it's a Moro barong. <laughs> First of all, the sheath is just really great. I, I had to uh, put all of this um, jute or whatever this material is. I had to rewrap it and epoxy it. and uh, But but it had been on there for so long, it took the shape. So it was kind of easy to do, actually. I just had to kind of, I just had to move it around on the sheath until it fit tightly and brush up some, some uh, medium there. I used a like for painting. So uh, yeah, Gorgeous is sheath, but look at this. So this is the traditional fat leaf-shaped blade of the barong. It's fully flat ground. Um, I think it might technically be chisel ground, flat on one side and then beveled to meet the other. But in any case, uh, uh, forged, no doubt, from spring steel, probably from a wagon spring or a, or a truck spring. I'm not sure how old it is, but it's old. Uh, definitely a bring back item from World War II. Um, I, I say definitely. I actually don't have papers on that, but that's the kind of uh, kind of situation or the kind of place where these, these things were purchased. That's the kind of stuff they had. Um, old K-bars and that kind of thing. Look at this handle, this beautifully carved handle. The barong is a heavy chopper, but with its with its length, I mean, you can. It's it's also nimble in hand. You can move that point around and make it uh, make it very effective. Uh, if you were to you know use this as a weapon, I have a great old picture that I have to dig out somewhere of of three geezers. That, I mean, well, actually, one of them is a geezer, and then the other there's like two young warriors and an old guy, and they all have these barongs tucked in their belts and they're just standing there smiling uh, not a care in the world because they have this on their belt no doubt now i wonder what kind of wood that is if anyone knows i mean it's gorgeous looks like a burl or something so that is uh one of my prized very prized blades that barong 
And uh, that's number uh, number eight. This one was purchased from a similar spot, similar place. And it is the last <clears throat> cutlass that was ever um, to be um, issued uh, to, to U.S. Navy. And it's the 1917 cutlass. You can see it's in the original leather scabbard. I'll put out of the way here. And uh, here it is. You've got a clip point blade, which is kind of cool. This was unsharpened, but you could sharpen that. And then this blade. I think the blade, though it has an edge all the way down here, I think it was sharpened more towards the front part uh, for cut, uh, for you know cutting and slashing. And then back here, uh, kept like kind of an ax edge. Like if you hit someone with it, you could split them with it split the skin, but also uh, to accommodate hitting other things, uh, other swords and, uh, and stuff. Uh, I think that's the case on this one because that's how it was sharpened when I received it. I've seen these with full baskets with the, uh, without the cutouts. And, uh, and then I've also seen them with longer blades. Cold Steel makes a version of this, a very popular uh, model that they produce. Uh, of this, and then they also do the longer, longer bladed version. This one sat on top of a bookshelf for a long time, and then I remembered that I had it, and it took its place on the wall of fame behind me, because this is a special and old sword, and who knows what the, uh, who knows what the what the history of is of it is in terms of who or how it was used. Seems like it probably was. Now I don't mean like someone boarded a ship and, you know, killed, killed people with it. But who knows? I think it was, it was issued to someone and carried. All right. Now the last sword that I'm going to show is the one that basically uh, started it all, uh, not only in terms of my love of swords, but also in terms of my love of, well, Filipino swords. And this was my father's sword. And he, used to keep it on a very high shelf. And uh, every once in a while, my brother Vic and I would say, Dad, get down the sword, get down the sword. And every once in a while, he'd pull it down and let us heft it. And uh, this was it. I always thought that handle was funny. And then I always thought the blade was funny because it's so... <laughs> I love how sinuous and slashy it was. I didn't quite understand the handle. I was like, why, why isn't it? And then, and then as I grew older, I realized, it, A, it's a Filipino uh, styled handle. And I wasn't really aware of that then. And also, this was probably a re-handle. Now, at this point, it's very, very old. But I suspected that this was not the original handle on this knife. On this, it's a uh, Taliban. Uh, that's the name of this blade. But I... I suspect uh, something a little more ornate was probably on there. Uh, that or that this is the base layer of something that had more wrapping and stuff on it. But really, I think that this was a rehandle at some point. It's a very useful handle, feels good in hand, and it gives you a, a nice balance to the blade on the, on the end with this uh, extra pommel there of wood. Feels great in hand. Uh, but it would have been interesting to see what, if I'm correct, what the original handle looked like. So that's it. There you have it. This is my, this is my collection of swords. This is my top ten. I have, as you know, I have some others on the wall behind me that are, that are close runners up, and I have some others kicking around here, machetes and stuff. But these are the ones that mean the most to me, and that are the most. Hmm, battle ready, if you will. To me, that's important because otherwise they are just wall hangers. Um, there are plenty of cool swords from movies that I'd love to have real versions of, you know, I'd love to have the Conan sword, but real, like I'd love to have someone make a real excellent version of it that you could, that you know, you could fight a barbarian battle or three or four with and not have anything happen with. But I mean, what's the purpose of doing that? Unless you're a hardcore collector and I'm not, I'm just I'm just casually uh, peeking in and uh, and seeing what what all you nut jobs are into. So anyway, 
thank you for coming and uh, joining up with us this week on this uh, Knife Junkie podcast, midweek supplemental show. It's uh, it's a pleasure. It's one of my favorite things to do because not only do I, um, well, do I get to check in with you, but I get to talk about all the stuff that I don't get to talk about during an interview when it's all about the people I'm interviewing. So, uh, you know, I get to show off my stuff and I really appreciate your coming by. Uh, please let us know what you think and call the listener line. Uh, let us know, you know, what's on your mind because the people around you don't care. The people around you don't want to know about your knives. It's like any given knife meme that you could find out there. They're all true. So unburden yourself and let us know what's on your mind. What's in your pocket? Uh, what are you looking forward to that's coming out uh, in the knife world? Or, or maybe it's a stupid knife story. You dropped a knife on your foot, something like that. Done it plenty of times. Sometimes you just need to get it out. Call the listener line, 724-466-4487. That's 724-466-4487. 87 and bottom line we just we want to hear it so that your significant other doesn't have to 724-466-4487 and uh we'll play it right here on the show well all right everybody that does it for me have a wonderful week uh check out the uh the uh the interview show right now we have matt chase of hogtooth knives uh, from whom my special birthday knife has been ordered i'll be talking all about that as progress pictures come in and uh, also check us out on Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, Thursday nights right here on YouTube. All right, everybody, have a wonderful week. And always remember, don't take dull for an answer. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.